Hi, everyone, and welcome. We are so excited that you're joining us today. My name is Jen Elder. I'm the director of SAMHSA's Homeless and Housing Resource Center, and we are just thrilled to have a great panel here today to talk about low barrier shelter models for people who use drugs. So I'll cover just a little housekeeping um, before we get started. Next slide. Um, so we are funded by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, um, but a quick disclaimer that the views expressed today aren't necessarily um, uh, reflect the views of SAMHSA or HHS. Next slide. Uh, we are joined today um, with American Sign Language interpreters and a live captioner. If you're having any technical difficulties, please feel free to shoot us a note. Um, you can reach out to us via email or via the Q&A. Um, our team is here to support. Next slide. A couple quick instructions. Um, we're going to be joined by a pretty uh, large group today, so all of your lines are muted and the chat feature is disabled, but we really welcome your questions. We'll have plenty of time at the end for Q&A, um, so you can submit those using the Q&A feature. You can also feel free to submit feedback on what you're hearing, um, something that you're learning, that you're excited about. Um, it's just our, your way to, to let our team know. Um, uh, your feedback. Uh, we received hundreds of questions during the registration, so thank you in advance if you submitted one of those. Um, the panelists have reviewed them and are prepared to answer um, as many questions as they can that, that came in before the event. The slides are available now if you'd like to download those on our, from our website and follow along. We'll have the recording in about a week. At the end of the session, we'll send um, a link to you for um, the evaluation, and you'll be redirected to a certificate of participation um, after you complete that uh, really brief post-event survey. Next slide. Um, and with that, I am really excited to pass it off to Kate from the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council. We really appreciate their partnership um, with us on this, on this webinar. So Kate, I'll pass it to you. Thanks, Thanks so much, Jen. Hi everyone, welcome. My name is Kate Gleason Bachman. I use she, her pronouns. I am the Clinical and Quality Improvement Nurse Manager at the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council. And we are so excited to be joining you all today with this wonderful panel to talk about a topic that I think is very timely and important. Um, we are hearing a lot about um, unsheltered folks, folks who are using drugs, um, how to make shelter spaces safer and more accessible to people who are using um, and we just keep hearing these questions again and again about how to make a shelter more low barrier, how to make sure people feel that they can um, access shelter and be safe and have their needs met. And so we are just so excited to have this panel of experts joining us today um, to talk a little bit about their own programs and then to answer some of the questions that you all came up with um, when you registered. And again, feel free to use the Q&A as we go. Um, if something comes up, we'll do our best to um, be able to answer it at the end. So with that, I just want to say a little bit about the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council. Um, we are a national nonprofit. Um, <clears throat> we work with healthcare for the homeless entities kind of across the board nationally um, to provide support, to provide training and technical assistance, research, advocacy. And we also work very hard to make sure we uplift the voices of people who have lived expertise in homelessness and all of the things that we talk about. Um, and you can learn more at our website. Next slide, please. Um, I just want to give a quick note about self-care. This is something we often do at the beginning of our webinars when we're going to be talking about um, topics like harm reduction and substance use. Uh, these topics can be difficult. They can often intersect, intersect with our personal and professional experiences. And so we are going to talk about substance use and harm reduction today. People can have many different experiences and views on this, and that is okay. And we just encourage you to um, take care of yourself as you need to. Next slide, please. Just a quick rundown of our agenda. So I'm going to do a very brief introduction to low barrier shelters, kind of what that is, so that we're all on the same page to begin. And then I'm very excited to hear from uh, Camilla's house in Miami, Florida and from Prevention Point Philadelphia's Beacon House, which is in Philadelphia. And then we'll have a panel um, with our experts who are joining us today. Next slide, please. Um, I just want to um, introduce our panel. So we have um, <clears throat> Jenny Gomez, who is the Director of Behavioral Health Services at Camillus House, um, Dale Tippett, who's the Director of Homeless Services at Prevention Point Philadelphia, and myself, 
And then um, we also have Romel who's joining us from Miami and I'm gonna let him introduce himself on when we come up to the Camilla's House slides. Next slide, please. So I wanna just take a minute to talk a little bit about low barrier shelters and kind of what that means. It's a rather broad term um, and it is meant to be, it's quite kind of encompassing of a lot of different models. So in general, <clears throat> a low barrier shelter or any low barrier program is a program that's easy to enter and that is easy to stay in. Um, and so we're looking at all different types of models that make it easy for people who are using drugs to access shelter and to remain in shelter. And that's done in a number of different ways. And as we'll hear, the models can vary quite a bit, which is really wonderful. This can look a lot of different ways, depending on what a community needs or what an organization needs or is able to do. Um, and different components can be implemented. And so you might implement an entire kind of set of standards that makes your program low barrier, or you may begin by implementing a few things to kind of take down some barriers that you've identified. And all of that is within the realm of being low barrier and is a wonderful step towards making shelter more accessible to people. So just a couple of things to consider. Um, one is the sobriety requirements. So a low barrier shelter specifically targeted for people who use drugs does not have a requirement of sobriety. <clears throat> Um, in terms of the intake process, so the intake is something that is trauma-informed, that's focused around harm reduction principles and approaches, and kind of lets people know the culture of the shelter, the expectations, for example, that people are um, expected not to use in the shelter, but it is a space that is safe for people who are actively using or, or active in their substance use. Um, harm reduction approaches are used generally, and this can look like a lot of different things. There's the focus on safety, on reducing harm, and certainly on overdose prevention. And we'll hear from our panelists about all of these things, but certainly about um, what they're doing to prevent overdose at their sites. Um, there are various supports for participants, and so these are quite broad. They're focused not just on shelter, but also on health, on safety, wellness, um, peer support, recovery support, on housing, medical needs, social needs. And so there's often a broad base of support around all types of areas of someone's life. Um, something to consider is curfew and then policies around bed retention. And so some programs may not have a curfew, many do, but those curfews may be a little bit later or a little bit more lenient. Um, <clears throat> and then in terms of bed retention, you know, in a traditional setting, oftentimes when someone doesn't use a bed for a night, they can lose it. Um, in a low barrier shelter, especially for folks who are actively using, there are often longer lengths of time um, that someone can be out of shelter before they start the process of losing their bed. So often like three to five days. Um, policies may vary, but there are policies around bag checks. Um, in terms of use on site, there are no shelters currently where you can use on site. Um, there are various ways that shelters um, manage checking bags, making sure that um, you know, what people have is appropriate, maybe doing a check around the bed area. And so our programs that we're hearing from today, will talk a little bit about that. Um, I mentioned broad supports. Those include referrals to housing, to substance use treatment, to medical care. And then in terms of retention, there is a focus, again, on getting people into shelter, but also helping them to stay. And so that's safety focused. There's a collaborative trauma-informed report approach um, for folks who may be having challenges in shelter, behavioral issues, and there's always a look towards safety, both for staff and for the participants in the shelter. So we will hear a little bit more about all of that. Next slide, please. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our panelists from Camilla's house and feel free please to um, introduce yourselves again. Um, and we are very excited to hear from you. So thank you so much. Hi everybody. Um, Thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Jenny Gomez. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I use she, her pronouns, and we are located in Miami, Florida, which is also um, Seminole and Miccosukee lands. And today I have with me Romel, who will be um, sharing his lived expertise uh, towards the end of the presentation. Um, next slide. So a little bit about our learning objectives. Um, this is all stuff that um, Kate just mentioned. So we're going to be discussing um, the characteristics of a low barrier shelter program, how they access them, um, some strategies for addressing common challenges, and then the overview about all the things I'll be discussing that we provide here at Camilla's House. Um, next slide. 
So this has um, a little video, which, you know, if you go on our website, we have lots of videos. Uh, but this one was, um, I think if you press next, the video might show up. There you go. Um, I'm not going to play it just for the sake of time, but um, this gives a really great background. Um, this is Brother Raphael. So we are um, rooted in the mission of hospitality from the Order of St. John of God. So we have several different locations throughout the world, um, and all of their mission is specifically to help those who are poor and experiencing homelessness. And the video is really important to me because he recently passed away, and he was a nurse and a lawyer and a really big advocate for um, those experiencing homelessness. So we started in the 1960s as a really small little soup kitchen um, specifically to help the Cuban immigrants that were arriving. And then once um, Brother Matthias came here, he said, I'm not going to just help the Cubans. I'm helping everybody who needs help. So that was one of our first pictures of the soup kitchen and everybody that was waiting in line to um, receive services. So from that tiny soup kitchen, which is where I started as an intern in 2010, we have um, moved into a really big um, homeless service agency, which um, I'll show you next. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so this is just a little background of all the different um, hospitaler orders of St. John of God that we have in North America. You're free to, if you click on the website at the top, um, you can see all of these programs. So a lot of them um, focus on harm reduction and uh, individuals with disabilities and um, the elderly who uh, were homeless and people living with HIV and AIDS. Um, one that I really love, they um, make their own coffee grounds, which is called Holy Grounds Coffee. Um, and uh, those that um, are stationed in Canada, they are really doing a lot of great work around low barrier shelters and harm reduction. Um, next slide. So this is uh, one of our pictures. There's going to be lots of pictures. So these are all the services uh, within the campus that we provide. We are the only um, shelter that has a day center, emergency shelter, a residential substance use and mental health treatment program, human trafficking, transitional and permanent housing, homeless prevention, street outreach, job training and placement, healthcare, behavioral health. So all of these services are in one campus. Um, next slide. So this is just a quick uh, overview of, um, it's kind of blurry, but the, this is what we present to our board every year. These are all of the, the meals, the clothing, the showers, um, everything that uh, we do sort of quantified into numbers yearly. So we are the only shelter here in this location that we have um, a day center where they can come morning and afternoon. Uh, first 100 people, no questions asked, you get a free meal. Um, you get clothing, showers, we have a mail room. Um, over here we have all of our treatment services, 235 clients a year in treatment, um, over 1,300 in emergency housing. So. Um, Next slide, please. So we spoke a little bit about what low barrier shelters are. So for here, we don't require any uh, criminal background check or credit check or verification of income. We don't require sobriety, any type of identification. We actually have an ID room where we create um, both staff and clients have an ID badge that they have to carry with them at all times. And this gives all of us access to designated areas. Um, and we've actually managed to use this ID card that we provide uh, to help them get a Florida ID at the DMV office um, or health insurance at the public hospital if they have no other form of identification. We don't require them to be compliant with medications, although we do have a clinic here that if they want to get on psych meds or any type of medication for their health, they're able to go to our clinic and access that for free. Um, we don't require program participation, but that depends on the program and the type of um, funding source uh, that's tied to it. We have a, um, a kennel, so we have about 18 spaces for pets. Uh, we usually have dogs. We have had some cats and I think a ferret once. Um, that was interesting. Um, so less rigid rules, more focus on their autonomy and self-determination. 
So we do, however, enforce a no weapons, no drugs or paraphernalia on campus, no threatening or physical aggressive behavior towards others. So we have two main entrances. Um, if you see here these pictures, that's how big our shelter is. Uh, it occupies an entire two blocks of the area. We are located predominantly in a, um, it's called Overtown, which is a, a historic black area um, and lots of um, Hispanics and um, different uh, populations here. Right down the street is our public hospital. So we are situated like a block from the health district, um, the crisis unit detox. Um, right across the street from us is the uh, University of Miami Needle Exchange. So we partner with them um, for those that want syringe um, services and they send them over once they want shelter, treatment or housing. So we are pretty big and what's, what's unique is that everything is in one area. So we have permanent housing in one building, we have shelter in another building, treatment in another building, human trafficking, a homeless prevention. So if uh, you're about to become homeless and you have an eviction notice, we help with that and pay off um, whatever you owe. Um, we have a garden, uh, a movie theater, auditorium. So all of that is within the entire campus. Um, next slide. So our day center uh, is really special to us. So every day we allow the first 100 um, unsheltered individuals. So these are all that individuals that do not have a bed here that for whatever reason don't want to come inside the shelter. We, um, we, it used to be over 150 before COVID. Um, we've, um, uh, we've reduced it to the first 100. So they're able to get all these services. They, they can wash their clothes in the laundry room. Um, sign up their mailing address so they get their mail here. Uh, we have a library, computer area, um, classes that they could take, um, different therapeutic activities down there. Some are like playing dominoes, they charge their phone. There's an art therapy room, which I love, um, and they get to just go in and create art. There's also some music instruments in there, so it becomes like a music jam session while some are painting. Um, there's some of our classes and um, the mail room and all that. Um, next slide. So our emergency housing, um, we have currently 294 bed beds. So this is a congregate setting. So we have managed to create um, these partnerships with providers that they contract the beds. So for example, different hospitals, um, South Miami, Baptist Hospital, they will buy a bed that if they get someone who is experiencing homelessness into their hospital, they are able to discharge them straight into the bed that they pay for, which ends up uh, charging the hospital less money because they're not keeping them longer than they need to and they don't you know, have anywhere to go. So these contracted providers between hospitals, um, insurance companies, uh, Molina and uh, Clear Health Alliance and Sunshine, all, all of our insurance companies here, they have beds as well. So if you have someone who's experiencing homelessness that has that insurance, they could call up their insurance company um, and they will pay for their shelter bed stay here. Um, also contracts with uh, police departments, um, I don't know, different, different providers. If they call us and they say, I wanna buy a bed, and refer our folks to your bed, they pay daily for that bed. So depending on the funder, they will pay for, there's 24 hour beds for those that want a short term stay and they'll just sleep here one night. And if they wanna stay here longer, we try to transfer them to a longer bed. Um, so 30, 60, 90 plus days, it just depends on um, the contracted bed they're in. And then of course, if something's going on, the case manager requests extension. So um, you know, depending on how how long they need to stay here. So they are asked to check in with their case manager at least once a week. Um, and that's just to let them know they're still here, what, whatever they're working on, or they're trying to get a job, or they want treatment, or um, they need an ID. So we do have a curfew that's 10 p.m. Um, so they're able to obtain a late pass. So if you talk to your case manager and say, I'm working late or I'm going to be out with family or, you know, whatever reason, they make them a late pass and then they're able to come in and um, pass curfew. 
Um, and usually, at least for for the the individuals in in um, in my programs, if they're going to be late, um, they already know to either call me or their clinician, and we coordinate constantly with security to let them know, you know, let our client back in. They were out, you know, past ten. Um, so everybody is given up to three days to miss bed count before they lose their bed. But this is depending on if like you disappear in those three days, no one has heard from you. Um, it's different if like, you know, you're hospitalized or you had to go, you know, to a funeral for your family member. So as long as you keep us in the loop of where you are, we continue to extend, um, your beds for as long as you need to be out for. So again, our kennel, um, We've partnered with a mobile vet clinic. So once a month, we have a mobile vet that comes and provides free shots, spay, neuter to all of our, um, not just the, the individuals that live here, but also the community. So those that can't afford uh, vet services, they come once a month and provide all that. We get free pet supplies and beds and all that. And then connected to the kennel right in the back is a, a dog park. Um, so they're able to walk their pets there. So if they live here, they're provided with all three meals, clothing, laundry, different training programs that I'll talk about. And then we have a medical and psychiatric clinic on our on site on our second floor, where they can get services there as well. Um, next slide. So our admissions process. Um, so once they're accepted into a shelter bed directly from whatever referral source, they go through coordinated entry, which is managed by our homeless trust system, which is directly through HUD, and that's for just shelter. Or if they want treatment services, it's a walk-in depending on um, bed availability. So it just depends what program they're, they want. And sometimes they're able to come into our lobby day center and, you know, if there's a bed that day, they're able to get one on the spot. If not, they're also put on a wait list and asked to check back daily um, until the bed is available. So they are um, required to complete their activities of daily living. Um, they have to be able to ambulate on their own or with an assistive device. The whole campus is ADA compliant. So as long as um, they're able to you know, go to the bathroom and just take care of themselves on their own because we, we can't um, provide that level of assistance. Although some have, um, like a contracted home health provider that maybe comes and checks in on them and helps them with a few things. So as soon as we admit somebody, we are required to immediately have them quailed. So if those that have never heard the word quailed, um, it's they have to take a shower with this special soap that removes their bed bugs from their person and also their clothing. Um, we have, you know, I don't, if you've worked in a shelter, sometimes you might get a bed bug infestation and those are not fun. Um, so we make sure to um, do the quailing process at admissions. And as soon as they're admitted and they're quailed and settled into their bed, we provide them with a welcome letter on their first day and orientation. You get them their ID badge, COVID test, TB test at our clinic. They're assigned a case manager. And then depending on their need, they're scheduled for a physical exam and psychiatric services. Um, next slide. So this is a sample of the welcome letter we provide. Um, it has the information that they need. Since our campus is huge, for those that have never been here, we have a map of where everything is located, um, you know, all of their information and when they're scheduled for their TB test, to meet with their case manager, to get their ID, all of that. Um, next slide. And then we have what's called Camilla's University. So um, this is uh, posted in our day center. We have different rooms there that have all these things every month. And this is open to anybody. So none of this requires any sobriety or any, um, you know, long-term commitment. If they're here that day and they want to go to art therapy or they want to learn about, you know, personal budgeting from um, TD Bank, we have um, the Mammy Day College comes here and provides classes. If they want a haircut, um, what else is on here? Computer literacy. If they want to learn how to use computers, we have a class for that. Uh, a class on learning and you know searching and applying for jobs. So this is every month, and everybody depend. If you're on the street, if you're in the shelter and treatment, any any type of client, they're able to walk into this class and use any of these services. Um, the legal clinic 
comes here. So if you have immigration issues or issues um, with the criminal justice system, you're able to get an appointment and speak with a, a legal representative for free. And then Project Unleashed is what I mentioned with the, the mobile vet clinic. Uh, next slide. So this is just a little uh, of flyers that we have all through our campus that sort of gets them engaged to want to attend any of these groups um, whenever they're held. Um, I have some of our clinicians, they run the LGBTQ support group. And again, it's just, these are safe spaces where they could come in if they want to that day um, and get any type of um, program they would like. Um, next slide. So then within the shelter, we also have, um, this is what I oversee, our residential substance use and mental health treatment program. So it's this building that you see here. And, you know, we run a treatment program that is a low barrier treatment program that's situated within a low barrier shelter. So it's, it's kind of unique um, because even though we have, you know, the requirements of different levels of care, like residential level two, four, day, night, outpatient aftercare, we are still running it very low barrier and um, depending on what their needs are. So we have our co-occurring recovery, our state opioid response. So a lot of these participants were getting directly from detox, um, directly from the needle exchange across the street. Um, and it's, it's a partnership with all that. Our jail diversion is a partnership with the um, mental health court and the federal court. Um, we have a veteran treatment court. Marchman Act is if they're involuntarily, you know, a family member or somebody like filed a Marchman order for treatment, they come here. And, um, you know, those are kind of a little bit more difficult because um, even though they have an involuntary, you know, treatment order, we still treat them all the same, where if they want to be here, great. If they don't want to be here, we're not forcing anybody to stay in treatment if they don't. Um, if they're not ready, if they don't want it at this time. Um, and then our newest program, um, which is GBHI, Grant for the Benefit of Homeless Individuals. Uh, we just got this towards the end of 2022, and it's a five-year SAMHSA grant. So this provides individuals with an extra six months of extended treatment. So you could have completed any one of our other treatment programs, and you, you still want more time. So we transfer you to our GBHI program, um, that just gives you more time and treatment. But even our other programs, if they want to stay longer to work on their substance use or their mental health, um, our clinicians are able to request extended stays monthly for however long they need to stay here. Uh, and that's them doing yoga in the bottom. Um, next slide. So we have um, situated in the same building you just saw, we have a human trafficking program. So this is another low barrier shelter model. So this is a separate unit that's, um, it's double locked. So only individuals that have badge access and the staff that work in that program are allowed in that area. So we are uh, getting referrals 24 seven. Um, we have what's called a grasshopper phone. So there's people in line, like the case manager, the clinician, myself, where we get these, um, referrals at any time of day at night, it's a hotline and we are having, you know, coordinated rescues from different uh, parts of the world, different states where they are safely rescuing someone that was trafficked and immediately sending them to our shelter. Um, so in that area, they have their own separate showers, living room, kitchen, patio, where they're able to go outside and smoke. Um, so these are referrals straight from Homeland Security, state attorney's office, Department of Justice, also, any hospital, police, um, shelter, any other agency, or self-referral. You know, we have individuals that are in encampments down the street that are being trafficked. And if they come in and say, I, I need to get away from my trafficker, we bring them in right away and, you know, provide safety for them. And they could stay here up to two years. And within that two years, whenever they're ready, we'll refer them to permanent housing. And again, they're provided with medical psychiatric care. If any of them are using substances and they're ready for treatment, then we're able to also bring them into our treatment program um, if they want to. Um, next slide. 
So we uh, started this pilot program called Brother Bill Bridge Housing. So this is uh, a transitional housing for individuals with a chronic history of homelessness who use drugs. So sobriety is not a requirement. And we remodeled these units and got free furniture from city furniture and all this stuff so that they could be there while they um, transition to their own permanent housing. Um, So it's either two or three people in, they have their own room and they share the common area. And then once they're ready, we move them into their own permanent housing. Next slide. So some of our training and education for participants, um, there's Romel with his uh, forklift um, picture. So we're able to provide all these things on campus, culinary, hospitality, they could get their GED. So we partner with local colleges and universities to provide these trainings on site. And again, you know, a lot of these participants are either in shelter or treatment or human trafficking and no questions asked. If you want to sign up, you're not required to be 100% sober. If that's not where you're at, but you're still able to um, engage in these um, trainings and education if you want to. So when they finish, they're provided with the stipends and connections to employment opportunities. And then we have graduations for them all the time. Um, next slide. So... Um, this is our partnership with the syringe exchange. So we are conveniently located right across the street from the, uh, university of Miami, the idea exchange. So this is just us, um, having direct communication with, um, those providers and they come over here and, you know, um, coordinate all this care for our mutual participants. Um, next slide. I think this had a video about that, but you know, for time's sake, if you want to go, um, and see some of the videos. I was gonna show it because it has uh, a lot of our participants are also in this video. So everyone that's on it has been through our treatment or our shelter program. And most of them are now housed. Um, next slide. So how we're dealing with safety and harm reduction, we have um, we house over 3000 individuals a year, uh, 235 are in treatment. And within our shelter, we have installed these opioid emergency kits on every floor of the shelter. Staff are trained on overdose prevention and how to administer Narcan. Um, There's boxes in our lobby, mail room, everywhere. Um, I go around just distributing and having it available to anybody. No questions asked. They just take it and I replenish it in all those areas. Um, We provide all of our clients that are coming into treatment with fentanyl and xylazine test strips, condoms, supplies to manage any withdrawal symptoms and their little welcome package. Um, And although drug use is not allowed on campus, they can come in under the influence as long as they don't cause any issues with others. So again, we have these weekly uh, meetings with um, the IDEA team and we are constantly discussing our, our participants and coordinating their care whenever they're hospitalized or need wound care or their medications. And then down here is just a map that we have of every Narcan station throughout campus. Um, Next slide. So some of our challenges, uh, you know, of course, the stigma associated with substance use, uh, the current street drug supply with the fentanyl and xylazine and all these new synthetic opioids that are coming out, you know, navigating their homelessness, their substance use, mental health, medical issues, everything at once. making sure that I implement harm reduction across all programs. So whether it's housing, treatment, human trafficking, that all of them are trained on harm reduction. Um, It's been a little difficult uh, changing the old school treatment modality to um, having a residential treatment program that is low barrier, that is focusing on harm reduction and trying to find other people to collaborate with that are also doing this. And of course, the increase in rent, Miami is super expensive and we have many individuals with a housing or section eight voucher that are sitting in shelter, unable to find housing, even though they already have a voucher. And of course, policy issues. So whenever an individual gets caught with drugs or preferably on campus and it's, um, you know, security or somebody catches them, we are forced to discharge them. Of course, we try to deal with things internally to provide them with the best care, and then the need for safe consumption sites to safely manage overdoses. Um, Next slide. And then this is Romel's section, so I'll introduce Romel. Um, Let me see. This is Romel, um, and this is his artwork here that I took a little picture of. (laughs) 
How you doing, everyone? My name is Fomel. Um, thank you for inviting me into this uh, presentation. Um, I'm a grateful recovering addict, thanks to Camilla's. Um, I I came broken. I came destroyed. I came uh, very uh, um, low self esteem, you know. Um, and this program had helped me so much, you know. Um, it had helped me recover myself, uh, recover my 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 relationship with my loved ones. Um, so today is my year and fourteenth day sober, and. Um, um, I've been struggling with this disease for over 20 years. Um, my, uh, my drug of, 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 of uh, what do you call that? My, um, drug of choice. my drug of choice was methamphetamine. Um, so, you know, I've learned, I've learned, I relearned myself again. Um, I've, I've, I've tried to do it so many different ways, but I couldn't achieve to uh, accomplish, to find myself again. Um, I came voluntarily because uh, I, I had no, you know, no other, no other options for me. You know, um, I, I tried to commit suicide. I failed at it. So I feel that he brought me to this place for a reason. You know, I'm very, um, into the, the 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 service in Camilla's, um, I try to help as much as I can with you know to others, the newcomers. You know, um, Camilla's have brought me to the into a new world of of and a new career for myself. You know, um, I've accomplished FIU courses. Uh, right now, I'm I'm finishing a course from FIU and being part of the jobs at hand hands on. And, um, so yeah, they're helping me right now get housing. I'm like a month away of getting housing. That's a blessing. And, uh, they've helped me with my driver license with, you know, connecting with my, my family, with my education, you know, financially, my, you know, um, trying to get in contact with my, my daughter that I haven't spoken in almost 12 years. Um, so, you know, I'm very blessed and and grateful, especially for Miss Jenny. You know, she has gone out of her way. You know, she goes out of her way to help everyone, you know. Um, and my clinicians and, and the case workers, you know, they, they do a great job here. Um, so I'm, um, I'm very close. I'm very close to um, uh, being part of society, you know. And um, so my suggestion for others is, you know, there is, there is hope, you know, there is a uh, place like this gives you a chance to uh, um, build yourself again, you know. So now I don't have, I don't, I don't, I don't have the idea of, of, you know, doing, doing what's wrong. Now I have the tools to do what's right, you know. Now I'm aware of what's going on, you know. I'm not, I don't live in the streets anymore. Um, I've, uh, I've accomplished a lot, you know. That's, that's the best I can tell you, I can say, you know. Um, and, um, yeah, they, they provide, a, they provide a lot, a lot of, a lot of things here in, in this program. It's, it's been great. It's been a great ride, you know. Thank you for letting me share. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both, um, Jenny and Romel. Thank you so much for sharing your story and uh, what you're doing at Camilla's house. That's really fascinating. I saw lots and lots of questions come up, um, and I know some of them um, we'll get to when we uh, come to the panel at the end. But for now, I want to turn it over to Dale Tippett. Um, <clears throat> from Prevention Point Philadelphia, um, their director of homeless services, who um, is going to talk about uh, their Beacon House shelter in Philadelphia. And uh, we're, the slides are going to come right back up just one moment. And then, uh, Dale, you can get started. 
Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I can see that there's almost 2,000 people viewing this. I really just want to take a brief second to give Jenny and Romel like a round of applause on um, that program looks wonderful i'll be looking for an invitation in my email jenny <laughs> um it's really exciting to hear about other programs and people who are doing your work um because there's such tremendous need out there um to address uh this issue called homelessness um in our country so i i bring greetings from prevention point philadelphia um, we are a grassroots on the front line public health organization right in the heart of Kensington, which some of you may know is the largest open air drug market in our country. Um, our organization has been around for several years. We were founded in 1991. You can go to the next slide. Um, we were founded in 1991. Um, we actually started in the basement of another organization. Um, and we were originally started to respond to the rise in transmission of HIV. Uh, so our organization really started as a means to, re to respond to that. Um, the then mayor, Ed Rendell, wrote a special order to make um, the distribution of syringes legal in our city. Um, and Prevention Point was one of the key factors in stabilizing the level of HIV transmission in this city. And so we kind of started with that and then realized what are some other things that we can do uh, to help some of the homeless population that is living in the Kensington community. Uh, so you can see our mission on the screen, which is to promote health, empowerment, and safety for communities affected by drug use and property. Poverty. Um, you know, a lot of our work is geared towards people who are doing survival sex work. A lot of our femme folks and some of our not so femme folks are relying on survival sex work. Um, and a lot of those individuals are also affected by the opiate use disorder. So we created just a safe space to try to bring everyone together. Uh, next slide. Um, Prevention Point is certainly a special place. Um, I've been working here about six years. Um, and one of the things that I loved about this space is that there was so much difference and uniqueness in all of the participants and staff. Uh, we make sure that we create an environment that is non-judgmental and based on respect. Uh, it requires trust to kind of work with people who are um, in varying stages of recovery. Um, we are here advocating for justice because unfortunately, um, government policy is not designed to benefit people who are using drugs or struggling with other kinds of things. Um, responsibility, advocacy, flexibility, transparency, these are all just some of our core values that if you look at each of our programs, you'll be able to find a piece of these words in the operational procedures and the philosophies of all of these programs. Um, we have the highest ratio of um, trans identifying staff of any public health organization in this city, um, which I, I believe we're between 12 and 20% of our staff are identifying as um, trans or gender non-conforming or non-binary or LGBTQIA. Um, and we also have several people who are working with us who have lived experience. So it's a really, really special environment. Next slide. Um, as I mentioned before, we started in 1991 as we were a grassroots organization. I'm sorry, I kind of went ahead. This that you see here is the executive order that was written. This is what all of our participants are technically supposed to carry if they have syringes. Of course, the police um, kind of know what we do and are very supportive of what we do. So I haven't heard of any participant being stopped by the police and asked where your card is, but this is what allows us to distribute syringes in our community and is still active and present today. Um, Prevention Point is distributing the most amount of syringes on the East Coast, if not in the United States. We have the um, largest syringe exchange program. Next slide. So as the organization has grown, we this is just an overview of the things that we are also offering in addition to my program, which I'm about to get into. So we do offer mail services. We currently have 
up to 5,000 people receiving mail at Prevention Point's address. Um, we offer case management. Um, we do have several options for our medically assisted treatment. So we do have some people who are on Suboxone. We do have some people who are on Sublocade, which is getting very popular. Um, we do have an ODP team, which is overdose prevention. Uh, some of you may have seen, we were recently in the New York Times talking about xylazine um, and fentanyl, and that was um, spearheaded by our overdose prevention team. So congratulations to them doing some big things. Um, they're doing trainings and going out in the community and distributing Narcan. We literally have like pouches that we just hook in random places all over the city that people could just take Narcan. Um, I also believe we are the largest distributor of Narcan on the East Coast as well. We're offering free meals. There's uh, medical care, wound care, three days a week in the main building. We also have, as I mentioned, the syringe services program. We're doing exchanges three days a week. Our wound care clinic is also um, expanding. Uh, we have free HIV, HCV testing. We also do women's reproductive health, which is not on the slide. Our drop-in center, which is very similar to what Jenny was referring to, is just like a space where people can come in day to day, um, get some coffee. They can be linked to any kind of services that um, they may need or may not need. Some people really just come in to get out of the cold or to get outside. You know, people are watching movies. There's arts and crafts. Um, there's all kinds of things. Um, of course, there's linkage link to drug treatment. Um, and then last but not least uh, is housing services, which is the program that I have the esteemed privilege of overseeing. Next slide, please. So the shelter. Um, I'm going to try my best to be cognizant of time. I can talk about the shelter all day and all night. <laughs> Um, I, as I said, I came to Prevention Point six years ago. I did, in fact, start in the shelter. Um, I started as a part-time overnighter. I worked Saturday, I worked Sunday and Monday overnight um, in the shelter while I was working full-time somewhere else. Um, and I, I just loved it so much that I ended up leaving that other industry and dedicating my full-time effort and energy into what we were doing at Prevention Point. Um, I just thought that the shelter was a very special place um, with a very special opportunity to be impactful um, in the lives of those who people seem not to care too much about. Um, and that is a good segue to go into why we created our shelter and what is this thing we're calling low barrier shelter. Um, if you were paying attention, um, both Kate and Jenny kind of went into detail about what constitutes a low barrier shelter. For Prevention Point specifically, we wanted to create a space that was designed for people who were using drugs. Uh, the shelter policies in Philadelphia are pretty strict, like most shelter, um, you know, environments are. They have curfews. You can't be using. You can't be medically fragile. You can't be in a wheelchair. You know, there's all kinds of things that come along with it. And we realized that those kinds of environments were just not working for our folks. Our folks would rather stay on the street in the element and at risk than to be inside of these spaces. So we said, what? can we do? How can we create a space? So we originally started a shelter in the basement of our main building, which is in the basement of an old church. Um, and we have since been able to expand the program um, due to the level of its success. Um, originally, when the program started, um, it was just an overnight shelter, but we realized that it wasn't working for some of our folks because a lot of our folks need to be up during the nighttime, if you're doing survival sex work, you kind of need to be up during the nighttime and you need an opportunity to sleep during the daytime. So as soon as we were budgetarily able or fiscally able to expand our program to being 24 hours, it was the first thing that we did. Uh, we also eliminated, like I said, curfews so people have the freedom to come and go as they please. Additionally, we are not doing bag checks. Um, at the at, when people come into our program either. Uh, we kind of operate off of an honor system. If people have things that they shouldn't and staff see it, we do, of course, confiscate and facilitate a conversation with them. But we wanted to just remove all of the stuff at the door just to get people inside of the building. Um, next slide. So 
So as I said, we want to emphasize safety and respect. So our program is, is very cool. We've consolidated our programs. We used to have two shelters on the app that we were required to consolidate into one large space, which is that brick building that you saw on the previous uh, slide. Um, we have 24 hour security at our door. Um, our security is contracted through the city of Philadelphia um, and they are managing and maintaining who is coming in and out of the shelter space. Um, as I said, bag checks is not a thing, um, but if someone has like a weapon on their perch on their person, or we see, uh, you know, they got a syringe behind their ear, it could be anything. Um, our security are retrieving that at the door. Um, we do have a storage space at the desk where people can store things that they don't want in their bed area. Um, but bag checks are not re re really a thing. Um, and the sleep boxes, sharps, containers. Um, as we said, use is not permitted in our space. So we do have sharps containers in all of our bathrooms, all of our showers. Um, due to the nature of our lease, we do not have like an amnesty box space. I've seen in several other low barrier shelters where they kind of have like an area where people can put their things and do their things that is outside of the space. We do not have that. So we do provide um, stainless steel extra large lockers for each participant to have in their bed areas. Um, and then sharps containers are available as needed. We do not have curfew. Um, as I said, people are, uh, you know, doing all kinds of things, living their lives the way that they want. So we do not have a curfew. People can come and go as they please. They are required to um, consistently meet with their case manager and our support staff are monitoring and documenting how people are utilizing the space. We have an electronic log. So we do know every two hours if someone is inside of the space. And we do also know if someone is sleeping inside of the space. Um, our bed floors are differentiated. Uh, we do have a ladies only floor. That is our only gender specific floor. Uh, we felt it pertinent for some of our ladies who just are not comfortable around um, male identifying individuals. So we created a space just for them. Uh, we also have a vulnerable, vulnerable floor, which I refer to as ICU. That floor is designated for people who have medical fragility, all of our people who have mobility issues. We are a four-story building, so we put people on the first floor who are in wheelchairs just in case there's some kind of emergency or something going on with the elevator. We need to be able to lift that person. Don't tell HR that we're lifting people, but we do what we have to do for our people. Uh, as I said, uh, we do have people who are dealing with wounds and wound care. Um, xylazine is in the drug supply. So there, there is at least 50% of our population who are dealing with wounds specifically from xylazine being in the drug supply. So all of our folk who have particularly difficult to manage wounds or extensive wounds, we kind of place on our ICU floor and providers are coming in consistently to work with them. And the top floor, our third floor, is primarily male identifying. It is not gender specific, but it just tends to be mostly guys that end up on that floor. Um, and lastly, our paraphernalia in use. Um, I'm going to go into this um, in, a, in a little bit more detail. However, paraphernalia in use, um, as most shelters, use is not permitted um, in our shelter. Um, and we do not have a safe consumption site. Safe consumption sites are still not legal um, in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, and to my knowledge, there is only one, one official um, safe consumption site being operated in New York City. Next slide. So what are our staff doing? So paraphernalia and use is the good segue into what our staff do because our staff's primary responsibility is monitoring and engaging if needed. So there can be a lot of downtime when you are a support staffer because we're not, you know, we don't have requirements of what people are doing during the daytime. So our staff are monitoring our bathrooms and monitoring our showers. We're doing five minute checks in our bathrooms and five minute checks in our showers. Although you are given 10 minutes to complete your shower. Um, our support staff are also walking up and down our bed floors and doing checks at 15 minute increments. That 15 minutes means that they have gone up 
to one end and back and verify that the people who were on that floor and utilizing that space are alive and well. Um, as I said, there's some light um, data entry, you know, just documenting who's using the space. Um, there is, uh, you know, prepping for meals. Uh, we do have like a kitchen person who provides all of the meals. So like prep would be just like heating it up, portioning it and serving it to the participants. Um, we are doing, of course, overdose prevention, response and reversal. Uh, day one, staff are trained on how to administer Narcan. We do a one-on-one -on -one training with a staff person. And then we also have videos and we have an ODP department that we also tag in to uh, work with training. But we've kind of created our own kind of training plan that really is a lot of on-the-job training. There's a lot of shadowing. You shadow a staff person. There are some like easy quizzes that we take that we're just trying to make sure that you have retained some of the pertinent information. Um, and then uh, crisis intervention and support, of course, it's all this comes along with just kind of monitoring, you know, our staff are watching, you know, and providing their input as best as they can to assist when it is needed. There are times, particularly in the summertime, where there's absolutely nothing going on and staff and a participant may be watching a movie or sitting and talking. Um, and then there are also sometimes during the winter months when it's cold and everyone is in here where it's absolutely insane. Um, you know, brief moment to take a second and encourage all the providers that are out there. I know we're going into the winter months. I'm sending you my encouragement and my strength because I know that those months can sometimes be really, really difficult. So be encouraged. You've got this thing. Um, I went very briefly into um, how we are training our staff, but some of the things that I want to talk about is um, also some of the things that we've invested in our staff. Uh, we have recently rolled out Organization Wide A Leadership Academy, which is for all of our leads and supervisors and people who have the potential or interest in leadership, which is a monthly training that is facilitated by a member of senior leadership or our executive board. Um, each director is creating training plans for each of our staff um, that involve like the basic on the job training that they need for their specific role. But then we also are in the process of rolling out a new system where staffers also spend time in other departments that are not their own so that they can learn a full spectrum picture of what we're offering as an organization. Um, one of the things that I think is really important to highlight about Prevention Point is that we take very good staff, very good care, excuse me, of our staff. Um, and that is investing in their self-care um, and utilizing this thing called paid time off. Um, we have a very generous PTO package. All of our staff, full-time staff, receive four weeks day one, which is incredibly generous, um, which we have learned is really helpful in making sure that staff are taking off the time that they need to get themselves together. As I said, Kensington is the largest open-air drug market in the country. We also have xylazine in our um in our drug supply. So when I tell you that there is no place like Kensington, there is no place like Kensington. We're dealing with people who are using 20 bags a day, 20, 30 bags a day. People are hammering through bundles on top of adding methamphetamine um, and maybe having a beer that day too. And so it can be incredibly difficult um, emotionally uh, to keep up with providing care and service for some of our folks. So our organization felt it pertinent that we really make sure that we give our, our staff the room and the freedom to take time that they need to regather themselves in the event that they need to. Um, we try to be flexible as much as we can with people um, and make sure that we're pouring into our, our folks. Next slide, please. So this is a brief kind of breakdown into some of our rules about paraphernalia in use. Um, as I said, we are not allowing people to use inside the space, so we do ask people to step outside. Um, in the event that we are finding that people are using inside of the space, we have a systematic approach as to how we respond to that. We tend to have discharge as a last resort. So we are aiming to have conversations with people before we are implementing consequences. We also came up with a systematic approach to tracking 
consequences. So we basically came up with a log where anytime someone does something in the space that we feel requires some kind of discipline, we are tracking that. And then we came up with a pre-organized grid. It's literally called the consequences grid that has a list of all the things that someone can possibly do in the space. I'm going to read some of them from like derogatory language, direct threats to violence to the staff or other participants to um, sexual harassment, physical assault, um, to like people urinating in places that they should not be urinating. We've come up with a systematic response for that, like first offense, this, second offense, that, third offense, this, um, and then a system as to how we are communicating with that person and then how we are responding when that person returns to the space as well. Um, it's been incredibly helpful to make sure that we are fair and equitable um, to all of our folks. Um, as I said, safe injection sites are not legal in our state. And so we try to be flexible with people when it comes to use because you know that people are going to use. So the first time that you use, we're not discharging you, um, but we are trying to facilitate conversations and remind people that this is a communal space and that, you know, we have to be mindful and cognizant of our environment. What we're doing may affect me differently than it may affect Vanessa or Karen. Uh, uh, one thing is a big deal, a big no-no is dealing drugs in the shelter. That is something that will get you discharged pretty quickly. I believe we do first offense, um, and then discharge, you know, afterwards, unfortunately. Uh, but we don't tend to have that issue. Our people really want to stay in the shelter, so they are doing everything in their power to prevent anything like this. We created this space for them, and there is no other shelter in the city of Philadelphia that caters specifically to our folks. So our folk are trying to stay. We have a wait list of over 150 at this time. Next slide. So just to go a little deeper into taking breaks and discharges, um, we know that like substance use disorder can really like affect people in varying ways. So people can be in all kinds of moods. I saw in the chat uh, when Jenny was talking, um, someone was asking about like, how it's nice in the daytime, but during the evening time is when things kind of get crazy. Um, this is exactly why we came up with this grid and this log to track and retain when people are doing certain things so that we can be fair. Um, you know, we definitely try to, you know, keep our staff prepared for like what it is. So like we have our very strongest and most seasoned staff on the overnight because we acknowledge that the overnight can sometimes be really, really crazy. We also make sure that we have on-call supervisors and on-call support to support people in the event that things are getting crazy. Um, but as I said, we're starting with verbal de-escalation. We're starting with a conversation. And then if we are asking that person to take a break, it is usually because we have already attempted to deal with this with a conversation. And now we are in a repeat situation and we need to respond with something that's a little more firm. Um, the longest we ask a person before discharge to stay out of the space is 72 hours. Um, there have been extenuating circumstances where like we have extended a courtesy to someone and maybe extended the amount of time to avoid discharging this person. Um, but as I said, this also is not something that is happening super often. I am happy to share our consequences grid with people. We've shared it with countless organizations. It probably could be helpful to you just to kind of view something like this. Um, but as I said, discharge is a last resort. We're trying to figure out, is there anything else we can go? Is there another space that we can take that person? We are often always handing discharges to our um, in-house outreach team who are managing and caring for that person once the decision to discharge them is decided. Next slide. Ah, and that is at the end. Um, I definitely um, came right under the nose on my time. Thank you, Dale. Perfect. Very good timing with for everybody. Um, thank you so much. That was wonderful. And I know um, I see all these questions popping up in the chat and I a lot of them have been answered by your presentation. So thank you so much. This has been wonderful. And we're very excited to now move on to um, our panel. And so we're going to hear from the same folks, but just in a panel format with some of the questions that you all 
have brought to us. So <clears throat> we're going to pull down the slides um, so that you can see our faces as we're answering the questions. And so um, Jenny, Romel, and Dale, yeah, feel free to um, come on camera. So some of these questions, as I said, um, have been drawn from the questions that people asked when they first registered. Um, I know a lot of questions have come up in the chat. Um, we cannot, unfortunately, get to all of them, but we're going to do our best to, to cover them. So the first question I would love to ask is just if you can talk specifically um, about how the low barrier shelter model has impacted either your life, um, and Ramel, that's more directed towards you, um, or impacted the life of the your participants, the folks who are staying in, in shelter. You know, what has been the impact of having a low barrier shelter available? Oh, it, uh, it has impacted me not to live in the streets, you know. Um, like I've never experienced you know, living on a sidewalk, but I did, um, I was living in my car, you know, and um, that was going from location to location, you know, if I got kicked out from that location. So I, um, I, I'm, I'm grateful to say that I don't have to experience that anymore, you know, and um, so, yeah, I mean, there's, uh, again, like I said, there's hope, you know, there's hope as long as you don't give up, you know, you don't give up and, and there's going to be people and programs like this that, you know, We'll give you a hand. Jenny or Dale, do you want to add anything about how um, the difference that it's made for people to be able to enter shelter while they're while they're still actively using? Well, for us, um, it it was a hundred percent necessary. Um, you know. Our people were not, there's no other place for our people. So, you know, we kind of needed to create an environment specifically for them. It's why we made it. And I have seen people who have never, ever been able to stay in any shelter come inside for the first time. And it's been incredibly inspiring and impactful. Um, one of the things that I see often is our folks sleep for the first week or two that they are staying with us. And to me, it makes me and the rest of my team feel like we have done something right because we've given that person the privilege of rest. Like, you know, I think a lot of times when you, when you have your own home, you can easily take for granted very simple things like being able to have a place to sleep very consistently. Um, so it's it's very gratifying, inspiring that we were able to create a space where those kind of requirements are done away with. So everyone has access to some kind of safe space. Um, yeah, definitely what everything that Dale said, um, you know, allowing them to come and rest and, you know, no questions asked, you know, if if you need a bed, you need some food, you need clean clothes, just all of the the necessities that um that people need to live and to you know feel good about themselves it's it's provided here and you know sobriety should not be like a requirement in order to for people to be treated with dignity and respect and love so i i don't know any other this is all i've known in the shelter world so like i don't have a comparison like there are others in this area that are more like um, enforce like uh, drug policies or you know religion or other things and and I don't work for them so like like this is all I've known and you know it's why I'm still here really. Thanks all of you. Um, you have described you know the journey of coming to be in your programs where they are, you know, it sounds like they, they both started rather humbly and have now become something bigger. Can you talk a little bit about what advice you would give um, to shelters that are just starting out or they're trying to become low barrier or move towards low barrier? Like what are, what are some places to start? And then Ramel, if you want to respond just in terms of what elements of a, of a low barrier shelter are, are the most important for participants as, as folks are trying to start this journey. Any one of you can, can jump in and answer. Um, I mean, I think definitely offering the basics 
and again with no questions asked they'll provide food and you know clothing and meals and a place to get their mail like all of the sort of day center stuff that we have here to start off with that and then from there you know i think a lot of it ends up just coming natural um so for those starting out i mean we started off as a tiny little soup kitchen in a corner that was run down and um you know every time it would rain you know the roof would leak and there would be full of you know mice and roaches everywhere and and even that felt like home for a lot of people and myself or like i loved being there despite how like you know small it was um and we we saved for i think over 20 years so we had these sort of fundraisers every year and and it was always that same mission of staying focused like one day we're going to build a huge place and be able to offer these services to thousands of people that need it in this community so it was staying in that little soup kitchen for over 20 30 years and saving up all that money for this bigger vision of having this comprehensive campus um so i mean you gotta start somewhere i would also say take it one day at a time yeah um you know i would say have expectations but give room for error um my supervisor and i used to have this joke how we always said that we figured everything out in the shelter by throwing against the wall and seeing if it sticks um and if it sticks it works and if if it's an epic fail then we you know cut our losses and make an adjustment i would also say understand that your program is your program and it's not anyone else's and so you can take the knowledge and expertise that you get from people like Jenny and Romel and my program, but some or all of those things may not work for you. You have to take the meat and spit out the bones, um, you know, do what works for you. And then also do not be afraid to constantly challenge your decisions. So what works for you in month one through six may not actually work on months six through 12. And you have to be open to assessing your program constantly and asking yourself those hard questions like, why are we doing this? Is this sustaining? Is this working? Are there ways that we can improve this? Um, And ask questions, ask for help. When you need help, reach out to other programs, go on the internet, you know, go to YouTube University (laughs) and, and learn what you can and see what other people are doing as well. Constantly be flexible. Yeah, I believe that, like Del said, you know, I believe everybody has a journey, you know, has their own journey, you know, and, uh, and, you know, coming to this program, you know, you, you have to deal with a lot of characters and personalities. And so it teaches yourself how to deal with different points of views. And, and, you know, um, and I've seen so far from, from experience that, Don't rush in to fix something that you cannot even fix. So you step back and it teaches you to step back and look, look at a different angle, how you can handle certain things, you know? So I seen, you know, unfortunately, unfortunately I've had friends that passed away here in this program, this year that I've been here. So, um, that's something that I, you know, I've never experienced in my life. So, it, it makes me look a different angle, different view, how people are hurt, you know, and you, you have to give people compassion. You know, that's another one. Sympathy is crazy how it, the human mind works in that level. Uh, give people sympathy, you know. Um, so, I mean, I'm no, I'm no different than anybody in this program, but every day, you know, I do challenge myself to do something right. You know, literally every single day I have, I have my, uh, my, um, my, I, I write every day, you know, um, I share my, my thoughts with my clinician every day. And, um, if something's bothering me, I'll pull somebody to the side. Hey, what do you think about this? You know, so communication is another one, you know? Um, so, um, 
yeah, we, we get to learn each other more and more as we go on this journey, you know? Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Ramel. I'm so sorry to hear of your losses. And, you know, I think you bring up a really important point about community and peers and the impact that community can have. Um, and that is actually another question that we got a lot of people wondering about the role of peers and community and kind of how that plays into your spaces and your your program models. You know, how do you utilize peers or, or foster community for, for folks who are staying in the shelter? So a lot of um, a lot of our peers are individuals like Romel that um, started off on the street in shelter and treatment, got housing, and they come back. You know, our we start off um, at least here in treatment with a morning meditation, like just for today. Um, they read from the just for today book, and they're running these groups themselves. So it encourages them to give back to each other, to their community. Um, same thing with like folks that have moved into housing, they check up on each other. Um, you know, a lot of the referrals that we get for treatment are from other participants that want their friends to come into treatment and want them to do better. Um, so having peers is important. You know, I don't think any of these uh, programs would really function the way they do without them. Oh, peers. Oh, peers, yeah. Um, you know, when I first got here last year, um, you know, I was timid, you know, nervous and, you know, out of my comfort zone. But I had this this friend, her name was Cynthia. And she was suffering from a COPD, but she kept ignoring it and, you know, pushing it to the side, which was helping a lot of us, you know. And, and so... Um, it was a Saturday, it was a Friday, sorry, it was a Friday. We were having just for today, and I hear the news, hey, Cynthia passed away, and I just spoken to her the night before, you know? So, you know, things happen that way, you know, because they have to happen, but but we learn, we, you know, we learn how to deal with that sober, you know, and, you know, with each other, and talk about it, and, you know, and lean towards each other's comfort. But, um, yeah, um, you know, um, this, this majority of, like, of people here, there's so much trauma in their lives that they don't know how or, or how to have a really simple relationship with, with your neighbor. So, I mean, I feel that myself and, and, and some of us, we, uh, we get out of our mind, out, out of our, you know, our previous thinking, our previous, you know, I was thinking outside the box and just bring him close and just talk to them and get stuff out, you know, because people just like to uh, box things in and afraid of talking about it, you know. So we have classes and meetings and, and you know, and people get more comfortable about it. And, um, yeah, so it's, it's a big deal. It's a big, it's a big success. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm going to switch gears a little bit, Dale, unless you want to um, jump in about peers, but <clears throat> um, we got a lot of questions about communities who are receiving pushback around harm reduction or around the idea of low barrier shelters. And so I'm just wondering if you could speak to kind of how you respond to that pushback. Um, an example that was given a few times is people saying, you know, a low barrier model is enabling of drug use and kind of how, how do you respond to that if you hear that kind of pushback about your programming? Um, so, I mean, I hear this all the time and I mean, not to sound, but I, I'm at the point where like, I just, I can't really, um, I don't want to say I, I immediately roll my eyes at them, but uh, because it, this is literally life or death. We're at, the, we're at the point where a lot of people are dying because of this, and um, we have to change the way we view um, substance use, and it, it's a necessity, really, at this point. So, um, you know, I tell them, like, anything else, or, you know, are you against condoms and seatbelts and sunscreen and all of the 
things that we've created to like prevent harm. So this is not any different than that. Um, and also, you know, when I've gotten pushback either from staff or other clients, um, there has never been a point in time where you have had a, uh, a program where there isn't that mix of people that are using and not using. It's always been. So even before I even knew the word harm reduction and I was working here in treatment, there's always a mix of clients who they are really this is their time to be a hundred percent abstinent. And that's wonderful mixed with clients who are not there yet. And, and I think even the most expensive treatment programs are going to have those same type of uh, people mixed together. So you're never going to have a point in time where everybody is so on board with a hundred percent abstinence. So you just, you gotta, you gotta, uh, you know, support both and everybody at the same time uh, and sort of balance that out. However, that looks like um, it's going to be messy and, you know, chaotic at times, but you just, uh, you, you love everybody regardless of the stage that they're in. My approach is a little more blunt. Um, I am also a very blunt individual, unfortunately. Um, so I tend to set my face as flint when I'm having conversations with people like that. And I make clear to them that one of the core principles of harm reduction is the understanding and acknowledgement that drug use is going to be an ever-present portion of the human experience. And that we don't get to control what people are using, but we do get to control how we care for people while they are using it. And so people, the thing about opinions is that everyone has them. What they do with them is what they do with them. Um, what we try to do is to make sure that we emphasize the fact, particularly in Kensington, like my shelter is in between two schools. And so there's a lot of parents who have a lot of feelings. And so we try not to like get into the minutia of the back and forth about what is actually going on with our program. Whereas we put our focus to like, we let them know that people are not permitted to use inside. We make sure that people understand that we are not a safe consumption site. Um, and that we also understand that we try to put the focus on what the program was started for, which was to minimize the transmission of communicable diseases and to also get people from off of the street. So I tend to redirect that conversation towards what the overall importance of the program is, not the specific details about it, because everyone is going to have their own opinion about whether we are enabling a person, you know, that goes into like the details of treatment. And what we have learned over years is that everyone's treatment path and plan is very different. So it's best for us to keep our mouth off of how we feel or what people's thoughts are on how people are managing people's different stages and walk through recovery. And say it with a smile. I'm sorry. Say it with a smile. Be blunt, but smile. <laughs> Thank you both. I know those are questions that we just hear so much in the harm reduction world, and it can get tiresome uh, to answer them again and again. But I also think, you know, those approaches and saying it with a smile and explaining to people kind of from, from the ground up why we're doing this and what it is, you know, it does carry so many more people along with us who may just have no idea what it really means, you know? And so in that way, you, you bring people into, into this work and understanding so much more. So thank you for, for all your responses. Um, I think I see, I'm trying to get to a few questions that are in the chat. Um, Dale, there was a question for you just in terms of the, the waiting list that you have and kind of how you do your admission process. So how, how do people get referred into the shelter it sounds like there's a lot of demand and then kind of what is that what does that look like for people who are coming in and then um coming from the waiting list 
So everyone is referred um, to our program. Like we are in association with the overall coordinated entry system. Um, so we're not like a walk-up shelter or anything like that. Like these people are actually being placed in our program. Um, so we're essentially not really an emergency shelter um, because once you are admitted into our program, you are in that program until you are matched to some form of stable housing. We have a Google form that you fill out um, and anyone can access it who has access to this site. Um, so like um, other providers from our main building and programs have that. Our outreach team also has um, access to the form and other outreach teams in the city also have access to that form as well as uh, some hospitals that we partner with and work with. Um, and there's a litany of questions um, we're prioritizing first, does this person use opiates? Um, is this person chronically homeless? And does this person have any kind of other vulnerability that would make access to shelter difficult in another program not specifically designed for them? And so if this person has untreated HCV or they are HIV positive, um, if this person is pregnant, if this person is in a wheelchair, if this person has an arm that's falling off, um, any kind of thing like that will kind of bump them up on the list. We do prioritize those who are the most vulnerable. Um, but a lot of times it's, is the, do we have a bed now? Is that person reachable and findable? And can we get them to the shelter? Um, so there's a lot of times like we'll have an opening, but if we can't find Vanessa for those three days, we're not going to hold that bed for Vanessa when Brian is standing right outside and Brian is checking off all the boxes to qualify that person for the program. So our housing coordinator and my outreach coordinator work together to prioritize who is getting in the shelter and when. Thank you. That's really helpful. Um, I think we're coming to the end here. And so we have just about four minutes remaining. So I just want to give a chance to all of our panelists, Ramel, Jenny, and Dale, if you have any final thoughts or things that you didn't get to share that you that you want to share with us before um, before we close. And I see um, in the chat that the um, survey for the training to get your certificate has been posted. So that, that's in the chat. But I'll, I'll turn it over to you all if you want to kind of add anything that you didn't get to say. Um, there were some questions in the, the feed. I've been trying to respond yeah. to some of them while I've been um, talking as well. So I apologize if I was not able to get to you. Um, but there was a bunch of questions about like no bag checks and violence and weapons inside of the space. Um, that is not an issue that we have been having. Um, as I said, our folks really want to be in our program. Uh, we do do inspections weekly where supervisors go into people's areas and just like do like a brief check. When we close for our admin days, we do do thorough checks of people's areas, like looking under their bed, looking through their locker if it's unlocked to see if there are any weapons or anything like that. I actually had like that behind that uh, Janet Jackson on my screen is actually a knife collection of knives that we have confiscated from people. But these knives are not knives that like participants are wielding in the middle of the lobby while we're eating lunch. These are weapons that they have on themselves to protect themselves when they are not with us, which is why we specifically are not, you know, we, we're not looking to take this from them because Kensington is a bad area and people do need to have the privilege of protecting themselves. And so if, as long as the knife is not on your hip and you're not pulling it out, it's not a problem for us. And our participants are very respectful of that policy and rule. We've never discovered a gun in the space or anything like that. And I'm not concerned about someone using it in it because this is a safe space, period. I'm sorry if I took too much time. Sorry, Jenny. Nope, no, no, I, I, I mean, you Dale, know, go ahead. I used to have a whole drawer full of knives. <laughs> um, there, there are, there, I feel like there's so much uh, on the chat that I was trying to get to. Like a lot are asking about contracted beds. So um, I think we, we charge anywhere from like, tw like maybe 30 bucks, 30 something dollars a day for all of those providers. 
So like the hospital is paying, the insurance companies, the police department, the the uh, homeless trust, which is our managing entity that comes straight from HUD. Um, outreach gets bad, so it just depends. Other uh, treatment mm-hmm. providers have bad, so thirty something. Yes, I know. There's a lot of questions. Perhaps I'll turn it back over to Jen. I know we're closing out with just a minute here. Um, this uh, is the link for the evaluation. And go ahead, Jen. Thanks. No, I was just going to say, too, like we can go right up to 230 if Romel had any last words, too. Didn't want him. Uh, no, I'm just uh, grateful that to be here again. You know, it's a great opportunity. And, you know, this is this is um, this is getting me more involved into this this side of, of, of the curtains, you know what I mean? Because a lot of people don't understand why, how these programs are run, you know, and this is a, this is a, a, an eye opener, you know, because I, you know, me personally, when I try to help people, I give them the best of my ability, the information as best of my ability, but seeing this is amazing. It's amazing how many people want to help, you know, and, 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 um, how, how, you know, the epidemic that we have right now with this, uh, this situation, this disease, you know? So, um, again, you know, thank you again for, for, you know, letting me be part of this. Thank you so much for coming and sharing your expertise. Ramel, Jenny, Dale, we just, uh, huge thanks. There was a lots of great feedback in the Q&A for you. Um, so the participants, um, just know we're going to get that feedback to all of our panelists. Reach out to us at HHRC if we can do, um, be of any assistance after the webinar. I know we didn't get to answer everybody's questions. We're going to be working on some follow-up resources too. So um, stay tuned. There is more to come. Um, so again, huge thanks to everybody. Um, we look forward to um, uh, attendees joining us on our next event. Thanks so much. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.